Welcome to the Broker Growth Accelerator, where we discuss how real estate brokers can accelerate their growth by improving their agent recruiting and retention. I'm your host, Jim Turner, and today we'll discuss growth tactics with our special guest, who is a subject matter expert in the industry. Let's get started. Hi, my name is Jim Turner, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of BrokerKit, and I'll be your host today. Today on the show, we're excited to have Avon Arnold, an experienced real estate coach with the Tom Ferry Organization. Avon, welcome to the Broker Growth Accelerator. Thanks, Jim. I am so excited to be here again with you today. Yeah, so this is part two of a two-part series uh, with Yvonne talking about how to streamline and improve your agent recruiting, onboarding, and retention to accelerate your growth. In the first session, we covered the, the recruiting side, how to find the perfect agent, how to land them. Now we're going to talk about, okay, they, you've, you've closed them, they've signed, they're joining your brokerage, now what? Because, you know, what I, I like to use uh, sports metaphors, and the best offense is a good defense. So the easiest way to grow is not shrink. So don't lose agents, especially, you know, good producing agents that align with your culture. So retaining those agents is equally, if not more important than the recruiting side to effectively scale your brokerage and your production. So let's let's kind of dive in there. So we found when working with real estate brokers that there's like a few parts that seem to really matter. Number one is onboarding them effectively. Two is coaching them. And three is like figuring out how to drive them, drive engagement with them and keep them involved in and kind of the the culture of the organization. Let's start out with maybe the onboarding side. And, and this probably is more important for new agents than existing agents. So the answer could be a little different, but maybe just, can you share some key strategies for effectively onboarding new agents to help them ramp to production quickly? Yeah, it's funny that you you mentioned might be different for a new agent versus a, an experienced agent coming into a new place. I'm not sure I would agree with that. I would think that I'm a believer that you should have a process and a system for everything and run everything through the same way so that everybody's on the same playing field and everybody has the same knowledge. Um, when you run new agents through something and you just assume the, the experienced agents or older agents know what that process is you're doing now, you miss the boat, I think, because they may not have learned something at their previous brokerage or doing business the way they were doing before. And you really want to bring them into your culture the way you do business and what your culture is doing. So I'm a believer the onboarding process is critical. And that can be, you know, a week long process or some teams that we know and brokerages we know have a 90 day process of onboarding. So it, it, it really is determined by the team lead or broker owner and and how they want to provide value and keep everybody moving forward in the system. So I'm a believer that you write out the SOP and there's got to be an SOP on onboarding. It's one of the biggest, most critical SOPs that you're doing if you want to grow. And so people go, well, what does that mean? What's an SOP? Standard operating procedure. We bring a new agent on or we bring an experienced agent on what are we going to have them do the first day, the first week, the first 30 days, the first six, the next 60 days, the 90 days? And what are the expectations that we want for them? So taking some time to sit down and brain dump that is critical and then build it out. And then some people are putting it as, as simple as a checklist and other people are putting it as uh, as extravagant as building a system like a trainual or, you know, Google Classroom or something. They're getting really extreme on their onboarding processes. So, um, but I think it's, everybody gets put through the same thing. And uh, no matter how much experience you have as an agent. Sure. And that's interesting that you, you, you mentioned the 90 days and we usually hear, you know, 30 to 30, 60, 90 days. Those are the, that's the time that matters. And, and I've hired salespeople in various different industries. And that 90 days is pretty common for really any kind of, but any sales professional in almost any organization. That's the time period where they really, you should be able to know by the end 
they should be able to kind of absorb, you know, kind of the, your system, what they need to do and, and, and start um, getting results within that period. I think in real estate, you have to be very cautious though. You really want them performing at the 30 day to 60 day mark, right, right. you know, otherwise they're going to run out of money and there's no money coming in. So you're going to have a real problem then. Yeah. And that takes me in my next question, which is right for them to be meeting, meeting expectations. You have to communicate those in terms of goals. Right. And ultimately what you care about is the production, but there's leading indicators of that around activity. Right. And I think that's kind of what you're touching on. Right. If you wait till 90 days to kind of measure anything, it may be too late. Right. Because they may not be driving the behaviors, the leading, you know, the 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 activity that's going to result in those that production later. So. Tell me what your thought process is on setting goals. What should they be? How should they think about it um, for those for those newer agents in your brokerage, whether they're experienced or new to the industry? Well, the first message I want to put out there to all realtors, whoever's listening to this podcast, is if you're going into this business right now and you're going, you have a limiting belief and you're going to push back on somebody who says, I need you to make this many calls. I need you to talk to this many people. I need you to hold this many houses, open houses. You're probably not going to make it in the industry. You have to be ready to hit the ground doing anything it takes to get a deal. Um, the work involved from day one. So coming into a brokerage or coming into a team, you have to accept the fact, yes, I'm an independent contractor. I know you can't tell me what to do at the same time as I want you to tell me what to do. And you have to be open to that, that team lead or that broker owner that says, Hey, if you go do these steps this week and then come back and tell me how you did, I can help you fix any issues you had and then go out and do it again and then do it again and do it again. So, um, so KPIs, key performance indicators are a big, big must. You've got to have certain boundaries and certain things that people are needing to say, yes, I'm committing to doing this. And that's a successful realtor. Um, when I started years and years ago, I was told that get on the phones, make calls, do open houses and door knock, and you're going to be successful. I didn't like the phones. I, I did them, but I didn't like them. And uh, there's people that love them. Uh, however, I grasped open houses and door knocking. And I committed for two and a half years to do open houses every single weekend, whether I had a listing or not, I found a place to do an open house. And I did it every single, every single weekend, literally for two and a half years. And I door knocked three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from nine to noon. I had a system where I knocked a hundred doors and my goal was to talk to 25 people. And I tracked that. And I didn't have a coach. I didn't have anybody telling me to do that. I went to events, I heard this, and I went back and executed it. Um, and we became top realtors because of it in our in our brokerage. So, um, and then the broker would come and say, you know, that's amazing. Can you teach the rest of my, my agents here, you know? And so we started sharing that with people. But, you know, if you're, if you're against KPIs or having somebody, you know, hold you accountable to doing something, yeah, unless you're really a great self motivator, it's going to be hard. The business is hard. So yeah, team leads and broker owners have to set a standard and minimum standards in teams is what we talk about all the time in Tom Ferry Coaching. And so what are some of those standards? Like what should they be kind of thinking about? By the numbers, we say a minimum of one hour a day of prospecting. I don't care what kind it is. It's you talking to other people. So it's one hour a day, a minimum, five days a week, five days a week, four weeks a month. That's 20 hours of prospecting a month. That's all we're asking. Okay. That's a minimum standard. So 20 hours of prospecting a month. And in that prospecting time, we know that if you want to do 20 to 24 transactions a year, which in my opinion, should be the goal for everyone. And I don't care what kind of market you're in. Some people go, well, I'm in the luxury market. I only have to sell 10 houses a year. Yeah, but it's just, if you're on a roll and you're doing 10 houses, why not go for 20? <laughs> it's exponential money growth, right? Um, so go for a 20 to 24 units close per year and people helped. Well, if you do that, to get to that, we know that you have to talk to a minimum of 150 to 200 people per month, okay? So if I say, 
I'm working 20 hours a month on prospecting and I'm talking to 150 to 200 people, little, literally conversations about real estate that I have a really great shot at closing 20 to 24 deals a year. And then we go from that benchmark. Those are the upper level, easy, top level benchmarks. Now we go deeper into that. And now you start saying, well, how many appointments am I setting when I'm talking to those people? So it's appointments set, it's appointments met, which are appointments held, and then it's contracts written. So those are the really very foundational benchmarks that somebody should be actually tracking. So it's hours of of prospecting, number of conversations had, uh, people talked to, um, appointments set, whether by appointments or listing appointments, appointments held, actually met, and then contracts written, listing or purchase contracts. Sure, sure. Well, and it, it's funny that aligns pretty well with really any sales role. And uh, in fact, you know, it, it aligns well with recruiting too. whether it's a broker owner or managing broker, they should be doing the same thing, honestly, on the recruiting go. side. So the, the numbers map up really well. And it's funny that those are the exact columns and our scorecard and broker kit for recruiting what Perfect. you just said. So <laughs> That's what the agents should be doing, right? So the audience here isn't really the agent. It's the it's the broker owner or the managing broker or their leadership team. The question is, well, and motivation is a tricky thing, right? Because in some ways, it's the hardest thing to, I mean, people are either are or aren't. And it's, it's one of the hardest things to control. But uh, tell me your thoughts on as a, as a broker owner or managing broker, how they can, you know, how they drive accountability, and it's not just accountability, the carrot and the stick to, to get to help, you know, kind of drive that behavior within the agents and, and their organization. Well, there's an old saying. Um, and at the moment, I can't remember who said it. It's somebody very popular and you'll know who it is. Um, when I say it, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. Right. OK. How do they know that you care? You ask them a lot of questions about themselves. Now, that works in real estate of an agent asking a client, a consumer, it works in a broker owner asking an agent. Okay. So if you want somebody to do something, you need to know where they're coming from. What motivates them? What's, what's their why? We hear about this big why, you know, Simon Sinek, uh, get to why, you know, the why is really hard. It's probably one of the hardest things that we coach somebody to decide on or to determine what it is. Because, um, I mean, I've had high performers say to me, oh, I don't know what my why is. I just know I want to do this and this and this. And I go, well, wait a second. Those are your whys right now. So we take somebody like that who can't get to the big picture why and we go, okay, what's your why this week? Do you want to make 10 grand this week? Do you want to go buy a new car this week? What do you want this week? And we broke it down, break it down into simplicity, right? And then it starts to take them to their bigger why. A broker owner, a team lead, recruiting agents, you will not be able to get them to move the needle ever. And I mean ever. Unless you know why they want the commission check they're going to go get. What do they need it for? Some people, they want independence. Maybe they have a spouse who's got a really great job, making a ton of money, and they don't have to work. But they want to be able to show that they're contributing and they want independence of their own, right? I mean, I've had friends who said, I have my job because I like to be able to go buy purses and shoes when I feel like it. You know, it's that independence, right? And not have to explain myself to anybody. And so it's others are like, I grew up with nothing. And I have a big chip on my shoulder to never have that happen in my family. And I'm never going to let it happen. And they have this drive that goes for them. And some people just kind of lollygag through life, believe it or not. And I would say there's a lot of people like that. They really don't think about it. Tons. It's a sad thing. I mean, I was on Instagram and Grit Capital, I follow them and they put that, I mean, it's some extravagant amount of percentage of of U.S. citizens don't have $10,000 in their savings account right now. Right. I mean, scary stat, right? 
because they really don't know why they're here. And, you know, Tom always says, you know, his, his mentor, Mike Vance asked him, why are you on this earth? Why are you here? Not here at this podcast, not at this event, but why are you here on this earth? Right. I found out my why a long time ago, helping people was part of it. And, but I like teaching people. I like helping people understand stuff and, and then they take it and do whatever they want with it. Right. Um, teaching. And so why do I do coaching? People go, why do you coach? You know, because I like to help people grow in their own businesses. A broker owner, a team lead has to have that same desire. They have to want to see other people succeed. If they don't want to see other people succeed, they just want to build the brokerage or the team for their own ego. They will not have a successful situation. And, um, and maybe they will They'll have some people that work there and make a lot of money because they attracted the same kind of people they are. Uh, it's the ego people, which is fine, but that burns out after a while, you know? And so really you want to see people make more money than you is what really the goal is. And you have to help them figure out why they want it. So that's where I go to. It's that mindset, um, that helps them motivate because once somebody taps into that and we see it in coaching all the time. They struggle with it. They struggle with it. I always tell people, if you start coaching with me, I'm a pretty dang good coach, but it takes me six months to get your head wrapped around coaching, right? So if it takes me six months to get your head wrapped around coaching, we have a lot of failure rate because people will give up before then. Broker owners um, and team leads have to get to that point. They have to understand it's a lot of work to help somebody get success that they want. And, um, and there will be failures and you can't save everyone. And that's why you have to be very particular about who you bring into your, your world and your growth pattern of what you're looking to do. I really like that kind of the concept of getting to know their why and as, as helping, you know, as key to the unlock for helping them, you know, kind of motivate to achieve these goals. So one of the other things we we hear pretty consistently with high performing brokerages and and teams and whatnot is just engagement too, keeping people engaged, making them feel like they're part of something. They're not just out there kind of on their own. They're part of a team, an office, a region, a brokerage that's bigger than themselves and just keeping them involved in whether they're office events, you know, kind of social events, things like that, training you know, tell me, like, what, what are your thoughts around kind of driving engagement and making them feel like they're part of something as as it relates to driving performance and retention as well? It's huge. And it, I believe it's bigger than the conversation around splits. It's huge. Somebody will stay with you at a lower split than you would even expect if they are feeling a part of something bigger, if they are learning all the time, if they are if they are treated with respect, if they are, um, they love being in the culture, you know, and, and you're bringing them in constantly and teaching them something and giving them, you know, bragging rights. You know, I always say, I always tell my, my team leads that I coach and brokers, you know, it's not all about everyone goes, well, if I want that person to help me do that, what do I pay them for that? And I'm like, why do you always go to pay? You know, why don't you make it that, hey, this is going to benefit you because you're going to have this knowledge. You help me, I'll help you. You know, if you help each other, you grow. We had an office, I think I talked about the last time, that had all the top performers in our in our brokerage in two offices. And the energy level was just, it was a buzz all the time. There was deals going up on the board and there was great events that we did. And we, we put people against each other and had competitions in the office where we did steak and beans contests and the losing team had to literally eat out of cans of beans and they had to wear tuxes and dress up and serve the winners steak dinners at a sit down dinner with China, you know, and people were like, they loved it. You know, you, if the top performer in the brokerage is on the losing team because it's very possible to be that way. And you're getting served by the, the guy that just closed $60 million in volume. 
<laughs> you're getting served a cocktail. It's like, oh, thanks, <laughs> you know, and it's just fun. And having events, having having things that people want to participate in. And right now we're seeing a lot of it because of the new style brokerages that are out there and, and that kind of thing. There's a lot of camaraderie happening, pulling people into masterminds. Um, having people present what one thing they're good at to a hundred people on a Zoom, you know, um, it, people sharing their SOPs for how do I do my open house. When you have that inside your brokerage, just in the brokerage itself, it's powerful. And so, um, and it's an attraction too, because now you're going to have all these, these agents that are happy where they're at, they're going to be recruiting for you. <laughs> Okay, so if you're really happy with where you work, you're going to tell every agent you have a deal with, you really should come over to our our side, you know. We have a fun time over here, and it sounds like you work alone in your house in your dark bedroom, and you don't have an office, and, you know. Hanging hang with your dog by yourself. Yeah, exactly, you know. How do you get your energy? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, and high energy is a part of any sales role, right? And we touched on that in kind of the first session. It's tough in a remote environment to yeah. be effective at sales. But that's retention also. There's that retention side of it where if I'm getting filled as an agent in a company or a team, if I'm getting my bucket filled of energy, I have support if I'm, you know, down sick and I got somebody to help me out and show open a door because the office works that way, I'm happy and I'm filled and I'm going to shout it from the mountaintops. Um, and it creates this interesting dynamic of um of people in in a culture and and in that case people are producing more deals so you have that we talked about quartiles that beginner agent new agent the middle agent and then the top producer agent um and that's where it gets tricky to to manage all those my grandmother used to say i have children and they're like my hand I love them all because I need them all. They're all attached to me, but they're all different. So when you have a brokerage, you have a hundred agents. You, you have a hundred fingers. You have a hundred <laughs> fingers. You have a hundred children. Okay. And some children are going to feel like they've been forgotten and left out. Some people are going to say that child is the favorite child. Right. And, you know, so we have to be very careful. <laughs> yeah. 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 You definitely don't want to tell the kids which one is the favorite. Bingo. You will, you will regret that later for sure. They will ask though. Let's see. I know from experience. So just more generally, what are some of the common challenges you see talking to brokers, you know, whether they be a broker owner, team leader, managing broker, when it comes to agent re retention, what are those common challenges and, and how can they address them? Recruiting is one step and that has its own challenges. But the retention, in my opinion, is the most important. It's the most important because I was at Remax for 24 years. That's retention. Okay. Now, why is why was I there for 24 years? Well, first off, my husband and I are not movers. Okay, we we're pretty pretty stable. I mean, I've been with Tom for 15 years. So um, so, however, there was a lot of reasons why we had great office space. We had great internet. We had autonomy. Um, we had broker supervision when needed. We had attorneys access when needed, you know, so we felt supported, that kind of thing. So there's a lot of reasons retention happens. Now, what else can create retention? Well, training, constant ongoing training, right? Uh, if you're not helping me in my business get more business, somehow, some way, and you don't have to buy leads for me or do anything like that, but you need to help me. Um, what do you bring into the table, right? To be at your brokerage. And I'll pay you more of a split in a brokerage if I know that there's value there, that you're bringing something to me, right? Now, what is that? Could it be like the luxury markets are really big on this? They have big gatherings of the luxury market agents all over the country, and they they fly in people, they bring speakers in and they provide value. So there's that. You can, you know, bring in your coach and have them do a, a day, half day event. You can, you can offer them things like what your company offers 
in the retention world. You know, what do you, what can a broker grab from companies like BrokerKit that's going to help them retain agents? So, if, you know, I, I'm in one of the largest I think the maybe might, might be the, the largest MLS. I don't know if it switched recently. CRMLS, Southern California. And with our dues, we have all kinds of access to products. And I'm on the CRMLS um, committee where there's several of us that get presented these new products. Uh, they pitch to us and then we give our opinion and then the MLS decides what they're going to do with that. But you know, I can go in and I can click off something and say, oh, I can use that. Oh, if I want a little extra of that, I can do a little paid version. Well, brokers have that same enterprise ability. So there's a lot of enterprise products out there that brokers can use. The problem I see is that brokers have it and then they don't know how to present it to their agents and get them to use it, right? You know, Moxie is one of the ones that, you know, there's a lot of great stuff inside Moxie, but Most of the brokers really don't know how to get their agents to actually access it and use it the right way. And if you're going to work at a brokerage that offers these things, we always say, use them, right? Why go pay it for for yourself if you're being offered it? So there's a lot of things that brokers can do. It's hard, though. It's like, again, time management. A broker has only a certain number of hours in the day and a lot of people they're overseeing. Um, and so do you have a sales manager? Do you have a manager of the office? Do you have an IT person or social media director in there that you're paying somebody to, you know, ch- cheerlead and create camaraderie and show them the fun stuff that they can use in their business? Um, there's a lot of that. Are you, do you have a marketing department that creates, you know, using Canva things that are that are templates for the agents and the brokerage so the agents don't have to do it. Example, I'm an independent agent, small mom, pop, indie, hang my license, just hang, have it hung. So I don't have access to a big brokerage. I have my own VA, right? So I'm paying for my own VA. But last night I just wanted a really quick, you know, thing to post a speaker event thing that I'm doing on, on Instagram. I spent an hour and a half on Canva. Okay. (laughs) And I'm thinking, I coach this this crap. (laughs) You know, it's like, why am I doing this again? But I wanted it done. And of course we're all control freaks. And, and I was like, no, I'm never doing this again. I don't want to use Canva. I want somebody else to create the template for me. So all I have to do is drop in my picture, (laughs) you know? So those are things that agents or that brokers can do really easily and not very expensively. Sure, sure. And so in your experience, what role does culture play in retaining real estate agents? And what can brokers do to like help create a positive and motivating culture within their brokerage? You know, culture is such an interesting conversation (laughs) because when you say the word culture, the definition, my definition without going to the dictionary, culture, a culture is a group of people who basically are similar and do the same things and they're in the same culture, right? So you have similar habits, you have similar background things. Well, if you try and create that in a brokerage or a team, you're almost going against the tide because you want to include everyone, right? You want to have have everybody coming in. Well, that's going to be different cultural things. Now it's going to be determined of, oh, well, I have, you know, this person doesn't like to go to events. This person is a solo agent and likes to be alone and they're with their dog in their bedroom making calls. Um, but this person only performs at a high level when they're busybody. They're all over the place. They're in the office all the time, you know, and they're disrupting actually other people. But she's a high performer. <laughs> OK, so now you have a clash of cultures. So. It's up to the broker to create what they want. And this is where the leadership comes in. You create the culture you're going to have, and then you attract who fits in that. And it's going to be a somewhat, somewhat broad, but, you know, definition. But that's why, for lack of a better word, there's an ask for every saddle, because 
basically I may not fit. Like I was a Remax agent for 24 years. I would not have fit in a big franchise like a Century 21 or a Coldwell Banker. That wasn't my, who I was. I fit in that in independent, autonomous, more type of style brokerage. So knowing that you have to know who you're recruiting and it goes back to recruiting. Are you spending time recruiting people that are the right fit for you and your business? Or are you spending time trying to recruit everyone? Because you're not going to please everyone and you'll have disruption and people coming in and out more often. But going back to your, your question, the culture is who the broker is, who the leader is. Tom Ferry has a culture. He breathes it from him. Okay. You follow Tom and then you have people that are miniature or trying to be miniature Toms, right? And helping people. Um, and yet we have 200 coaches and, and every single one of them is different. Again, grandma's hand, right? However, they will bring in who f- attracts them. So this is where when brokerages start getting into 100, 200, 300, 500 agents or more, you have to start creating almost like pods. You have to put somebody who attracts this group uh, overseeing that group. And then you have to put someone else who attracts this group overseeing that group. Now you have really um, cultures inside a culture and it works. And so that's when you get bigger and it's um, then you have success. But going back to recruiting deeper bench for sports analogy, you have to keep that deep bench going because people will come and go because they won't fit. You know, there's not always a perfect fit. So um, so you need to keep the deep the bench deep. So um, all good stuff. So I have conversations weekly with with brokers just asking them, you know, really talking about how to how to accelerate the growth of their brokerage, whether it be on the recruiting or retention side. And one of the questions I ask is just, you know, what is your attrition? And I'm especially curious this year. It seems like the the variance has expanded a little bit, but I'd say, you know, it ranges anywhere from on the low end single digits, of, you know, like 7% a year up to maybe mid thirties. I've heard, you know, anywhere from our annual attrition is from maybe call it maybe 70% to 35% with most of them somewhere in the, around the 15, 20% range. What are maybe just, do you have any anecdotes or success stories of brokers that were particularly good at this, where they, they, they were on the low side of attrition, you know, the people they hired tended to, to, not just be successful, but stick, be successful and stick around. And what, what was it about them that they were doing that was different than the rest out there? I mean, there's, there's one that comes to mind really quickly in their large company now. Um, and, uh, and that's the EXP franchise. I mean, it's a very interesting dynamic. When they came into play, I had several current and past coaching clients call me up and say, Hey coach, what do you think about this? And, um, they were from all different places. They were agents in a regular box brokerage and they were, um, agents that were independent brokerages, owned their own boutique. And, uh, they all had different reasons for going there, but the attraction, um, again, was of course the elephant in the room, the revenue share, which, you know, has, uh, has, kind of became an animal in itself, but I would say beyond the revenue share, um, it is absolutely the attraction of the culture that those agents, when they started there, created. Um, so there are several large groups that put got together and then started their own masterminds and their own events and telling agents, you know, I know you're an independent agent in that city and state, but because you're in our world and uh, in our bubble, we're having an event in Baja, you know, so come to Baja and, you know, here's what we're, and then they provide value and big franchises, you know, because they got so big, the hundred and 150 and 200,000 agents like a Remax and a Realogy and, and Century 21 and all of that, you, you tend to have to lose that. You know, that's a difficult thing to keep going as a big company. Um, you know, we used to go to the REMAX conventions and meet up with other REMAX agents and, and all of that. 
Um, and it's still going strong, but I think that the grassroots style has just really taken hold. And that's not doing the culture from the top down. That's doing from the culture from the bottom up. And that's agents alone bringing people into the fold, sharing what they have and not being afraid of giving away everything they do. And, and by the way, you can give away everything you do. And there's only about 10% of the people that will actually take it and use it. And so don't be afraid to give away what you do. Right. And so, so that's kind of that little secret, I think that's kind of out there now and it's now in real and now it's in the luxury presence markets and all of that. They're starting from the grassroots and the agents on the boots on the ground are really creating this, this culture. And then the broker owners are benefiting from it. And if they're smart, they will, they'll get in and be very involved in that. And the ones that we know who have actually been able to do that, no matter what brokerage they are with, um, if you adopt that mindset, it works in every brokerage and they're successful doing it. So we're in a, a rapidly changing world where the, the change seems to be accelerating. You've got interest rates up, seemingly down now, hopefully down you know, quite a bit more. Um, you've got technology coming in and disrupting patterns. iBuyers seemed like they were the big thing. Now, not so much. You have, um, you know, all kinds of trends. You have the flat fee brokerages, like um, you have the, a big lawsuit recently with NAR. Um, so, you know, Ray, Wayne Gretzky always said, you know, skate to where the puck's going to be, not where it is. Lots of trends going on, you know, but, you know, the brokers out there need to be thinking to continue to grow. I need to be thinking about where I need to be, you know, one to three years from now. What knowing that that's a really hard question, you know, what should they be thinking about so that they're kind of best positioned, really? Well, I might upset a few people when I say this. Brokers need to go back and pay more attention to what training needs to happen with the agents and not just worry about what you're going to offer somebody as a split. We got so far away from training agents the correct way. Um, it's why we're in these weird times of lawsuits and everything else. And, you know, people talking about um, the Australian way of selling real estate, you know, um, which nobody should ever talk about in the United States. Um, Australia is a completely different animal. They have no buyer representation and they're an auction country. So uh, it's way far away from what we have that is so great for consumers. Our, our real estate world and how we do real estate in the United States is absolutely consumer centric. We are all about protecting the consumer. And yet we have these people saying there shouldn't be any protection for the buyer. <laughs> You know, so I'm, I'm intrigued by it, to be honest. I've been through enough changes that I just go, yeah, okay, we'll adapt. You know, real estate agents and, and indus the industry is very adaptable. I've adapted many, many times. Do I think there's going to be a less, lesser number of agents? Yeah, this could be the, the one thing that will cause the industry to, to decline in numbers. Um, you know, everybody says, oh, that crash is going to cause you know, a bunch of people to get out of the industry. No, it hasn't. None, none of that has come true, right? Uh, more people get in. And so, but this could absolutely be the differentiating um, situation. And, and the reason is brokers need to train agents better. We need to know our contracts better. We need to know how to explain the contracts better. So when we talk about where's it going, interest rates can change all they want. I got into the industry as an escrow secretary when rates were 17.5%. So I bought my first house at 10 and a half percent and everyone goes, oh, but the prices were less. Yeah, but I was only making 35,000 a year and I bought a house, you know, so so our income has changed, too. <laughs> so so everything is relative. Um, this too shall pass with rates. They will fluctuate. Just get used to it. Who cares? You know, um, the anomaly that everybody experienced with two and a half percent interest rates that they should just consider themselves lucky and be able to talk about it to their grandchildren. That is not norm. Five to 6% is norm. Um, and so 
I look but, at it. But I will not be moving anytime soon. But you will not be moving. Okay. But here's, oh, I have a little prediction. I went through the 1990s and the 2000 crashes. Yeah. I am a studier of human nature. And I'm a believer that people will absolutely refinance those two and a half percent interest rates and they will sell their houses to get the money out of their house. They're doing it already. And consumer debt is what people should be paying attention to. When credit card debt goes through the roof and people cannot afford what they've now got in debt, they will absolutely pull that money out and not think twice. I'm already talking to people about that in real estate and my clients. You know, and so when that happens, guess what? They have <laughs> a high we, rate and they're not locked in anymore. They have a high rate. They're not locked in anymore. They more than likely will not be able to afford that higher rate payment because that's not where their heads were at. And they will either just start selling their homes or they will let their homes go because they pulled all the equity out. And that's human nature. And we are an interesting little easy people to read as humans, right? So I'm I'm um, I'm one of those that don't get too excited about any of it when it comes out on the news. Um, I find it intriguing that people are like, you know, buy buy the house, marry the rate, marry the house, buy the. I don't know what they were saying. It was like, are you serious? Um, and now they're saying, ooh, rates are going to come down two or three more times next year. It's like. Powell can't say anything like that. He, he will affect the economy if he says something like that. And if you watched him yesterday, which I did, it was like he said one thing and then he said something else to counter it. And he said something and then he countered it with something else. And I'm like, it, the 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 uh, reporters were trying to corner him any way they could. There wasn't ha- it wasn't being had. Okay, so no, you know what I think? I think we're going to see it flat. We might see it go up a little. We might see it go back to flat a little. And then next year's an election year. So you've been around long enough. What happens in an election year in real estate? Somebody wants to get elected. Somebody wants to get elected. But what usually happens, and I always say it this way, doesn't matter what party you belong to, money gets conservative. The dollar bill and and money, period, gets conservative. Everybody holds it. So election years are always slower years in real estate sales. And we already have the inventory issue and all of that. So I would expect things to slow down towards the election. And, you know, who knows what happens at that point? And, you know, they'll try and entice us to do stuff by giving us credits here and, you know, breaks here and tax breaks here and this there. Don't fall for it because bottom line is, it's an overall economic thing that we should be concerned about, which is where we're at right now. And it's a, it's interesting. I, I'm not Nostradamus. I couldn't tell you. I just know my gut um, says, just don't get too excited about anything. Save your money. And if you're a realtor out there, save your money and, and start cutting everything. And I tell everybody, you can cut your own taxes. And they go, what are you talking about? Well, right now is business planning. Go into your bank statements, credit card statements, and chop away anything you're spending money on that you have not touched or used or didn't even know and chop it away. That's you just cut your taxes and get rid of your expense. Um, one of the other things is how many users. I heard this the other day, which was great. What, what are, how many users? You know, I have a product like a CRM and I have seven users and I only have three people. Well, cut your user down to three instead of seven, right? So there's some hidden breaks in there that you can give yourself. And then you set yourself up to be just go sell real estate, go recruit a bunch of agents, help them sell real, more real estate, help them get attract more sellers so we get more listings and, um, and then stay the course and put your money away. Sure. As Tom says, don't buy dumb shit. <laughs> <laughs> that, that helps. Yeah. Yeah. Focus on, and, and I would say, you know, kind of along those lines, think of what's an investment versus a cost, right? What's going to help you bring in revenue, you know, and that's going to be sales and agents who sell, right? And focus, you know, the cost on things that 
that deliver those, right? And that's what's going to have the highest ROI. Exactly. And just don't, you know, cut costs, but focus on things that are not revenue producing. Exactly. So. And that's, you know, to, to leave it with that, from an agent perspective, I do a, a, a talk and in there it says um, one of the, the, the statements that I make is there are three stages of wealth. And the agent that thinks splits is on the low run. The agent that thinks income is in the middle, but the agent that thinks assets is the wealthy agent. So agents should always be thinking about assets. Brokerages should always be thinking about assets. If you're renting your building, you might want to look at buying a building, right? And, um, and figuring out how you're going to, to, make it more of an asset um, so that you gain that wealth. I mean, we're in real estate. You know, we should always be thinking of assets. Plus, my husband always says the government uh, allows you to have assets, not income. So if everything is an income, you're taxed at the top level. <laughs> so, yep. you know. Yeah, there's some great. Yeah, you're you're strongly incentivized to invest in real estate. Even in especially when you have a real estate license. There's a lot of little loopholes for real estate licensed um, uh, humans, <laughs> so it's right, great. <laughs> right. Well, that that covers all my questions today on agent um, retention. Thanks so much for your you know your thoughts there. For the listeners out there, hopefully you you've got some things that you can put into action. And Yvonne, um, if our listeners have any kind of questions, where would they find you online? Um, they can find me at, um, at Yvonne Arnold underscore on Instagram. They can also email me at Yvonne at Yvonne Arnold .com. Well, thank you so much um, for, for um, talking to us today, Yvonne. Some um, great things that all the listeners can think through and, and put into action today going into 2024. It's a great time to be introspective about these things when pulling together your goals and, and you know what you're going to put into action for 2024. Thanks to the listeners for tuning in. Please listen in in the future for more future actionable tips. Thanks so much and have a great day. Thanks, Jim.